Hello everybody and welcome to the NHP webinar on ArcFlash presented by myself, Nick Thompson, Quality Manager for NHP. Uh, you'll see in the uh, in the window that there is a Q&A section box there. Um, feel free to post any videos there at any time, any questions and um, uh, those will either be answered on the fly by some of our su support staff, otherwise we'll go through them at the end. Okay, so the program for today. Um, so one thing I really wanted to point out very early on is that this is an overview presentation. It's not a comprehensive study. Uh, so uh, don't for a minute think that you're going to be a technical expert when it comes to arc faults and arc flash. Um, it's a real career for people. Um, there's a lot of information and very knowledgeable experts out there. Um, but this is an introduction to get people moving in the right direction and start making some of those uh, decisions and um, have some ideas around what, how they want to handle this issue. So technical presentation, um, it's going to cover the serious business of arc flash, the physical aspects of an arc fault, uh, the physical, uh, the regulation around arc faults, and also an overview of mitigation strategies that are available. Although this is a technical presentation, uh, I really wanted to point out what the stark reality of this issue is, is because this is really a safety conscious sort of technical issue. Uh, the Queensland ESO, which is the Electrical Safety Office, the regulator for Queensland, um, have just released a really powerful video. Uh, it's not very technical, but it's more about the message um, and Mark's story. So uh, Mark's an electrician. Uh, he experienced firsthand an arc fault uh, event. Um, it was a very avoidable incident. Um, he was adding a power analyzer to a live switchboard. Uh, he did a lot of things wrong and he acknowledges that now, but it's not anything that we haven't seen uh, from uh, electricians out there in our own world. So really the message that they're really pushing there is don't work live. Um, so we'll go into that in a little bit more detail later, but it is a serious issue and it does result uh, in deaths. So Queensland ESO put this together mainly because they've seen a growing increase in arc flash incidences. Uh, so they've had 22 reported arc flash deaths and injuries over the last four years, which they're really uh, worried about seeing. A little bit here on the definition. Um, so an arc fault is the flow of electrical current between phase or phase to earth through a high impedance plasma medium. So usually that's through air. Uh, and an arc flash is the event or injury surrounding that. So that's sort of the definition between the two. So you'll see them used interchangeably. Um, you know, they do mean effectively the same thing. Um, but, you know, for me, elect uh, arc fault is the actual electrical event and arc flash is the overall event. Um, so, you know, that definition of what an arc fault is, it's effectively lightning. Um, so you think of that flow of electricity through a plasma medium, that's effectively what's happening during a lightning strike. So everybody's seen that before. Um, and this is a really nice photo from Queensland that a friend passed through to me. So how do arc faults develop? So electrical power distribution systems are used to um, prevent uh, current flow between conductors by the use of insulation. So air, oil, vacuum, uh, plastic, rubber, all sorts of things can be used for that. But effectively what we're trying to do is get power down the conductors and not between them. So on the right hand side here we've got a miniature circuit breaker chassis. Uh, so this one actually experienced an arc fault event. Um, and I will go into a little bit more detail on that in this particular case in a minute. Um, but you can see there that that air gap is used as you go between those tags to actually separate out those conductors. So I've got two different types of arc faults that can actually develop. So the one that we're actually seeing here is what's called a parallel arc fault example. So that's where you've got two different conductors 
and it actually jumps across between the two. And that, that second conductor can be neutral or earth as well. Um, series arc fault is a little bit different. So that's actually where you get a broken cable um, and the power continues to uh, flow through that conductor, even though it's broken. So uh, very common to see. Um, a good example is in solar DC systems where the solar panels effectively act as a current source and it keeps pushing that current through. But in general sort of power distribution um, applications where we see these large arc faults, usually it's a parallel arc fault that we're talking about. So let's go back to that original case. So we've got a bit of a better photo here showing what can happen. So you can actually see between those tags, we've actually got material being chewed away and there's actually two tags there completely missing. Um, so this is a arc fault that's extended for an ex uh, extensive period of time. So it's always interesting to see, you know, how these things sort of come up. So with this one, it was a fairly straightforward investigation. As soon as we received this one, uh, we could see some pretty clear uh, oxidation on the tags there. Um, and some follow-up on site discovered that there was actually water ingress into this switchboard. So basically what happened was, uh, this was a site in Melbourne in 2019. Uh, the switchboard itself was a retrofit into an existing building. So it was re replacing a older switchboard. Um, and a section of the feeder power cable was actually exposed to water by other trades carrying out work on the site. Um, so this wasn't anything known to the electrician. The electrician had done all the right things, um, but it was other trades that had actually exposed the cable and not realized that that was going to be a problem. So the water actually traveled within the cable because it did actually pass through some um, uh, glands uh, and it actually made its way onto the conductors. So water and electricity, um, obviously not a very good, uh, not a very good mix. So effectively, uh, what happens there, um, we'll go into a little bit more detail a bit later, but you can imagine that the, that water is what really started that uh, flow of current. So one thing that I'll point to as well that we'll come back to is this was a rare case where, relatively rare case, where there was nobody physically at the switchboard at the time of the arc fault event. Um, so this happened with closed door, in a switch room, all on its own, and it's only when um, basically the lights went out and the circuit breaker tripped that people went to investigate what had happened. So what's the nature of an arc fault? So we do get these in high voltage and low voltage um, applications, so above a thousand volts, below a thousand volts. Um, they've got a little bit of a different uh, characteristics though, depending on the exact scenario. So in high voltage, um, they're very easy to initiate. You're dealing with very high voltages. Uh, so it's much easier for that arc to be generated across a further distance. Um, but you are talking about lower actual uh, fault current levels. Um, and that progression doesn't seem to happen as much. Um, in low voltage, it's harder to initiate. Um, you know, you're only to, you're talking about, um, you know, very good sort of air being a very good insulator in that sort of space. Um, but you do have higher current fault levels and higher progression as well. Um, so that current uh, level actually generates, uh, you know, that, uh, that plasma medium and it can actually uh, propagate back up towards the source. So some other things that are very important for exactly how an arc develops is obviously arc gap. So how far across that has to actually jump. Um, the available fault current and subsequent arc current uh, that actually flows uh, in the system and the protection used in the clearing time uh, for, that gen for that application. So the photo on the right here is actually from um, a study where they took some photos of that plasma medium developing over a three phase fault. So you can see there the actual arcing across um, from that uh, second peg to the first and third and a little bit of uh, remnants on the bottom one there. So you can really see that plasma arc pretty clearly in that image. 
So what's the results? Um, we've got a very large release of energy that occurs. Uh, so a blinding light and deafening sound. Uh, and what that can mean to people working on site, death obviously uh, is the extreme end of it. But through the injuries, you get uh, severe burns, uh, vision damage. So unless you've actually got uh, uh, protection uh, for your eyes, you imagine it's like looking into a welding arc uh, and hearing loss as well, uh, very loud sound. And for the sight as well, um, going away from the safety a little bit here, there's also significant sight damage and downtime associated with that. So if you have a look on the right hand side image here, this particular arc fault, uh, basically it's completely destroyed that switchboard uh, and you can see the hole in the back there where it's sitting in front of the brickwork. So you can imagine that uh, there's been quite a lot of damage there for this to occur. So you imagine the downtime for a whole switchboard to be built, manufactured and then uh, put in place of one that's been existing for some time. So now to have a bit of a look at the electrical behavior of an arc fault. So what a difference between this and some of the other things that we see in overload and short circuit is that these arc faults are high impedance faults. So air is a very bad conductor. Um, so it actually uh, is far lower than a short circuit current. So about 38% seems to be the kind of uh, rule of thumb, but Generally, the numbers quoted are usually between 30 and 40% of the available fault level. Um, so what that means is it's very hard to detect. So usually all of our protection in circuit breakers and fuses, etc., are usually based towards that overload and short circuit fault current time profile. Um, as such, the time to clear can be significant compared to what we would like. Um, so it kind of fits into a very awkward um, awkward area using that current sampling. So we've actually got a bit of a um, theoretical uh, time current curve here. So for those who haven't seen this sort of graph before, uh, there's a very good webinar on selectivity that was carried out um, on this same NHP channel a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and this is the uh, time current curve. So time going up the left hand side, current going up along the bottom there and both of these are logarithmic scales as well. So what these three curves represent is a small molded case breaker on the left going up to a larger molded case breaker and uh, up to an ACB. So the idea is that if you get a fault um, downstream of all three then the smallest uh, breaker will trip first if it's upstream of that, then the next one, then the next one. Um, so you can see there that the ACB is actually designed to sit on a fault for a significant amount of time um, by design. Um, so you, the idea being that if you've got a downstream fault, that you don't have your uh, main incoming circuit breaker trip out. So what happens when it comes to arc faults? So um, the blue pen here is basically our theoretical uh, arc fault current. So stepping through, uh, you know, this theoretical one, uh, initially um, that curve, uh, that arc fault current uh, behaves as a short circuit. So you've got a sharp increase, basically linear shown on this one here. Um, and uh, the high, uh, and that can, let's say there's a tool that's been dropped in. So probably better to use an example. So let's say there's been a tool dropped into, into in between the phases. Immediately, you've got a short circuit. So that short circuit, very high increase in current in a very short amount of time. So it looks like a short circuit. And that's that number one point that we've got on the graph there. Then if that tool vaporizes, it turns into an arc fault. So immediately you've got a much higher impedance than the short circuit that originally started off the, uh, the event. So what happens is the current will drop to that point number two, and then it'll slowly increase as that arc develops, more arc gases uh, created, and eventually the current climbs up into a region where the trips start to occur. 
So you can see there that uh, even on a 400 amp, on this theoretical 400 amp molar case breaker, you know, you could still tripping out in a significant amount of time. So you're looking at that sort of half, half a second sort of time frame. But if it happened to be further up towards that four and five, you can see there that's getting into seconds of tripping time, which uh, is an eternity in electrical terms. So in conclusion, the current based protection against arc faults, it's not a great fit. So it does work, but it's when it works. So eventually it works, but by then a lot of energy is passed through the system. So there's a term that's used quite a lot uh, called uh, incident energy. So I just wanted to explain exactly where that incident energy comes from. So incident energy is basically the uh, total energy over the area of incidence, let's say. So think of it like pressure or sound, sound wave intensity. So you've got a point source of energy that actually expands out uh, in a spherical fashion. So propagates uh, in that spherical area. So you can see there that uh, as you go out for further distances, it actually it's a one over distance squared relationship. So that energy is being dissipated. So it's an important sort of relationship to keep in mind. So the further away you get from uh, the initial source of the energy, uh, far better off you are. So that proportional to one over distance squared, very important. So um, what can we do with that? So in practice, there's a few variants on how we can actually calculate that incident energy calculation, but it's really based on assumptions. Um, and the reason being that uh, those assumptions, they don't happen, you know, an arc flash doesn't occur uh, in a perfect open air scenario. The energy will be shaped, directed, deflected, um, depending on exactly how it's, uh, you know, depending on exactly the scenario that it's in. Um, so the, fl the flow of energy can be different, but at some point you have to actually uh, come up with something pragmatic that you can actually work with. So this is the incident energy calculation that's most common and it's probably the easiest to follow as well. So very simply, it's electrical energy, so voltage current time divided by a constant uh, to give us the right um, units and then uh, the distance in centimetres squared. So the distance in centimetres squared is usually used as 30 centimetres. So if you think about that, you um, the 30 centimetres is usually the distance from your working hands. So you think you're working on, you know, you're writing something down or you're working on a circuit breaker or something. Um, and that distance from that object back to your face and chest, that's about 30 centimetres. So that's usually the sort of uh, figure used. Um, and interestingly as well, some people use this formula backwards, um, which is also an interesting use. So they'll actually um, calculate arc level boundary for a given incident energy level. So to put that into practice, you think that um, you know to get a certain to get to a certain distance away from the circuit breaker, you need to have a certain amount of PPE on. So if you're staying away from that main incomer, you can get away with just you know, your regular uh, work outfit. If you're getting closer to that main income while it's live, you might have to suit up into something a bit more appropriate. So that's actually something that I've seen examples of. Um, so actually painted on the floor of a switch room. Um, so, you know, for those more sort of progressive sites, that's something that they can do. So that's the kind of basic equation. I'm not going to go into the details of the derivation of that and I'm not going to go into a lot of the other ones that are available. Um, I do provide some further reading at the end of the session, so by all means go and have a look at those. So what do we have to do? Um, as a person in charge of the electrical sonar site, um, there are some guidelines to follow. Um, really good resources to go through and talk to this about are your regulators. Um, so if you um, approach them uh, proactively, they're usually very, very helpful. Um, 
and there's uh, these model work health and safety regulations as well. Um, so these ones are from safeworkaustralia.gov.au. Um, very good um, resource actually. So uh, a couple of ones here which are a bit more general, but you know, electrical risks are you know, involved. So Judy Holder in managing risks to health and safety must identify reasonably foreseeable hazards that could give rise to risks to health and safety. So arc flash, arc faults definitely fall under that category. And then managing those, Judy Holder in managing risks to health and safety must eliminate the risks to health and safety so far as reasonably practical. And if it's not reasonably practical uh, to eliminate risks to health and safety, minimize those risks so far as reasonably practical. So, um, you know, fairly important there. Um, another imp important part there as well is AS3000, uh, which is the wiring rules. That's actually a legal document as well. Uh, because it is actually brought into the wire, state wiring rules. And um, so there is some guidance there, which we'll go into a little bit later. So um, there's this requirement for, um, you know, your occupational health and safety, but there's also AS3000 you need to follow. So one question that always comes out of this is working live. Um, it's obviously a major, major thing and um, don't work live is the, uh, is the, uh, you know, the message always passed on, but there is realistic situations where that's not possible. So there is actually guidance for that in that same document. So in the health and safety regulations, section 4.7157 actually gives you some uh, guidelines on this. So uh, very important thing here is it's saying don't do it. Um, and then it lists the exceptions, but note the exceptions as well. So testing purposes. So sometimes you need to test things while they're live. Uh, that makes sense. You know, you have to actually uh, carry out some of those tests on live equipment just by, you know, nature of them working while you're testing them. Uh, Life-saving equipment. Um, so obviously there's some medical applications there that, um, you know, they need to be still running while you're working on them. Uh, or if they need to be energized to be worked on, uh, or if there's no reasonable alternative. So it is a bit um, bit gray there saying no reasonable alternative means, um, but really what it does is it then goes on to describe requirements for risk assessments and practical steps around that. So it's saying don't do it, but if you really need to do it for you know these specific reasons, then um, you know, here's some guidelines to do it. Now, again, uh, your state regulators are very good with this sort of stuff, so long as you approach them with the appropriate sort of uh, tact. So if you go to them and actually ask them, this is what we're trying to do, this is why we need to do it live, they'll actually be the best ones to help you out as well. Um, so risk assessments. Um, so I'll cover those in a little bit of detail because um, not everybody's seen those before and bring it into a little bit of a you know, relevance. So a risk matrix chart. Um, so anybody who's done a risk assessment before has probably seen something like this. So this breaks down uh, likelihood versus consequence. Um, so um, giving you basically a cross reference there because um, obviously there is some uh, extreme dangers out there uh, which people need to deal with. You think about window cleaners, um, you know, 40 stories up. Uh, there's some extreme consequences there and the idea is to make that likelihood as low as possible to bring it down to an overall score of a moderate. Um, so that's how this sort of table works if you haven't seen it before. Um, uh, so we'll come back and kind of refer to this a few times, but this is just an idea of a tool that's used out there. Um, and obviously I've listed there, don't work live again. So uh, with the don't work live, all those injuries and issues, uh, the uh, consequence moves up a long way um, and moving up or to the left is basically the uh, direction you wanna be moving with all these. Related to that is the hierarchy of hazard controls. So this is basically um, lists out 
uh, the best ways to address some of these issues. Um, so the least effective down the bottom being PPE. And the reason for that being that PPE is down to the individual user, making sure that they follow through the right procedures, making sure they haven't got any holes in their pants or, um, you know, any, uh, you know, everything's tested and in date. Um, and then the most effective up the top there being elimination. So elimination, um, turn the power off. So highly preferred, but not always practical. Substitute, so you can go back to windmills, grindstone, that sort of thing. Um, or more seriously, uh, use ELV power where possible. So be, uh, by ELV, I mean below 50 volts. Um, usually 50 volts DC is what we see. Um, so a lot of mine sites, et cetera, use that sort of approach. So all the controls on the front are all 24 volts DC, and it's only 240, 415 right at the back of the cabinet where it has to be. Um, you know, to minimise where those arc faults can actually occur. Um, and three to six, let's see what our options are. So let's start at the bottom. Um, let's talk about PPE a little bit. Personal protective equipment. So when we're working with this sort of stuff, we're talking about pretty serious sort of equipment. Um, there's actually a reluctance in a lot of documents to actually specifically say exactly what uh, equipment to use. Um, usually the wording something like use appropriate PPE um, doesn't really help you too much. But there is one standard that brings that through, which is the NFPA 70E, which is a US standard, which goes in and gives recommended PPE levels. Um, so that went through a significant revision in 2018. It seems to be updated every couple of years and it gives recommendations based off calculations and it also gives recommendations based off activity. So basically, if you're going into work on X, it says this is the sort of PPE you should be using. Um, that NFPA information is then used by IEEE and even uh, locally our Energy Networks Association document. Um, so a lot of people pull from this NFPA one. So as a bit of a sidebar anyway, uh, the NFPA uh, is a US organization. It's actually the National Fire Protection Association. Um, so yes, firefighters. Um, so it sounds a bit strange that firefighters are telling us what to use for electrical gear, but they actually set standards for electrical safety in the workplace. And uh, there, you think about firefighters, they're required to go in and isolate in emergency scenarios. So good thing about firefighters is they've got a very pragmatic approach, um, which is they have a job to do and they need to do it. Um, so it's exactly what's needed for this sort of touchy issue. So looking at that, uh, PPE recommendations. So this is for the calculated arc incident energy that we saw earlier. So 1.2 calories per centimetre squared and below. So this is basically from nothing up to a fairly low figure. Um, so untreated natural fibre, long sleeves, pants, a face shield, hearing protection, heavy duty gloves. So it's talking about this for anything basically um, that you go work on. Um, then in this 1.2 to 12 calories per centimetre squared, it's talking about arc rated long sleeve and pants, arc rated face shield. So they're like that photo in the last slide there, which I'll just go back to briefly. So that's a arc rated face shield there. Um, lead boots, insulating gloves. Um, and then above 12 calories per centimetre squared, it's talking about arc rated suits like what you've got on the right hand side there. So Due to the comfort, the cost of the suit, difficulty in carrying out the work while you're wearing the suit, um, there's a lot of reluctance around using these. Um, and also if somebody's uh, asked to wear one of these, um, a lot of people aren't too keen to get into the sort of work where they have to wear something like this to do their job. Um, so not a, it's a pretty difficult one to work with. So a panel board, just to bring that into kind of perspective, will usually fit in that 1.2 to 12 calorie per centimetre squared sort of area. Um, that's generally where they seem to fit. AS3000 gives us some recommendations as well, but 
important part about that is this is a formula to minimize damage to the switchboard. <laughs> so it's basically a constant times the rated full load current divided by arc fault current to a power. Um, so it's saying to assume that uh, arc fault current is 30% of the short circuit current. So again, this is to minimize damage to the switchboard. It's got nothing to, it's not really about operators. So let's have a look at the actual example out of AS3000. So 800 amp uh, board, short circuit current of 16.67 kA. So 30% of that is 5 kA, it gives us a nice round number. And the clearing time it gives you is 0.57 seconds. So the breaker interrupting time shall not exceed 0.57 seconds at 5 kA. That's it. So it's basically saying, do this and you're on the right track to minimize the damage. That's all it really goes into. Um, so there is a bit more that uh, bit more to look at there, which we'll come back to uh, for that specific uh, figure that we've come up with there. So the other thing 3000 brings in as well is switchboards above 800 amps shall be protected against the likelihood of initiation of arcing faults by ways of internal forms of separation, form 3B, 4A, 4B. So I'm not going to go into the detail about forms of separation, um, but um, the idea is that um, you're reducing the likelihood of an arc fault event starting by introducing these forms to, to isolate the uh, conductors from one another. So on the right hand side there, that's a photo from our switch our cubic switchboard system, um, and that's a housing variant, so a H variant um, of the form. And that means that, you know, if you're in there and you drop a tool down onto it, the tool's never going to start an arc fault because it's never going to be able to touch those conductors. So that's a way that cubic uh, go about it and fairly common out there. The other one you'll see is insulation and barriers and all sorts of things. So that's an important one there. Arc fault containment, you might have heard this one before. So this is under 61439. Um, and I just wanted to explain the sort of testing that goes into this one as well. So it's very much focused on the operator. So this is actually our cubic switch, switchboard system under test. So basically they put this cheesecloth uh, in front in the operator zone, as it's called. So that's a 30 centimeters away from the front of the switchboard. And the idea is, is that an arc fault's initiated inside the board and this cloth should not be affected. So um, specifically it's in front of the board. Um, so the requirements for this is that it has no dangerous effect to the uh, operator zone. Uh, the arc's confined to the switchboard internally and it's exhausted safely. Uh, the switchboard may sustain damage that requires extensive remediation works, so still need that clean up. Um, but the switchboard must be mechanically sound, so you can't have any doors falling off or anything like that. Important note though is that this certification is void once the switchboard door is open, um, which I was looking at a European study about arc fault occurrences, and it was saying that 65% of the time an arc fault occurred while somebody was working within a sub-assembly. So makes sense if you think about it because it means that somebody's in there messing around with it and something happens. Um, so the likelihood for a switchboard on a wall minding its own business for something to uh, suddenly occur is pretty low. Um, so yeah, 65% of the time it was with um, you know somebody working in that area. So it's some food for thought. Okay, so moving on to some of the mitigation strategies here. Um, so many arc faults involve a path to earth, uh, either immediately or as part of the progression of the faults. So on the right hand side there, we've got an arc fault which actually chewed through most of the switchboard. Um, so quite simply, if you implement earth fault or, and or earth leakage protection, uh, you'll often reduce the uh, time for clearance because earth fault is a lot more sensitive than uh, your overcurrent short circuit protection that's usually in place. So on the bottom left there I actually included a photo that I saw uh, that a, of a board I saw recently which is actually a I think that's a 2000 amp 
earth leakage CT. So all the conductors were going through that at the bottom of the board. So implementing that, you obviously reduce a lot of the energy that's involved. So the most common mitigation strategy that's been implemented for a few decades now is light detection. Uh, so basically it's a photo sensor that picks up the blinding flash of light when an arc occurs and it quickly initiates a trip. So that can be within a few milliseconds. Um, so there is a bit of caution there that if you're taking photos and um, or doing some welding or flood lighting or something nearby and that light gets into the switchboard, um, you can get a nuisance trip, but obviously, um, you know, you should be taking a bit more care than that probably when you're looking at this sort of uh, gear. So on the right hand side, there is the NHP uh, variant. So that's the arc sensor and then the edge unit down the bottom there, which initiates the trip with the upstream protection. Another option for detection uh, is you actually get a large pressure wave as well when this uh, when arc faults occur. So solid copper expands to 90,000 times its size when it goes from solid to gas. Um, so the air pressure within a enclosure immediately increases and it can be used to initiate a trip. So this is an example of one from our high voltage range. So that pressure plate there that's across the top there, basically that gets pushed back, it's hinged, and that pulls on that cable there that's um, going down the bo bottom left there. Um, but again, caution, won't necessarily work with the door open because that pressure wave may not be enough to actually push it, uh, push it as it's intended. The rest of our system there in the high voltage world is a form of arc quenching, which there's quite a few different variants out there, um, but effectively they all do the same thing. So what they do is they create a three phase to earth fault to replace the arc fault. Now, yes, that sounds mad, um, but it creates a very easily detectable fault for the overcurrent protection to actually pick up on and clear. Um, the other thing it does, which is very important as well, is it reduces all those voltages down to earth potential immediately. So it takes a lot of energy out of the system. So this can help not only with the incident energy levels that you see in the uh, switch room, but also with the cleanup that's involved. So instead of basically completely refurbishing something, it might be a clean up, retest, and off you go. So definitely some uh, uh, good potential there. Sorry, just to, um, I will just address that yellow arrow as well. So basically this mechanism, that shaft there, uh, basically turns 90 degrees, and those contacts make with each of the phases. Um, just in terms of how that works. So an important question we field quite regularly is, do these things actually do anything? I mean, you know, uh, there's always products out there in the market. What's the actual effectiveness of these things? So let's go back to that example we had from AS3000, the interruption time of 0.57 seconds. So plugging in those numbers to that, uh, formula that we had earlier, um, we get 25 calories per centimetre squared. So at that level, you're definitely looking at a spacesuit. Um, you know, it's it's pretty uh, intensive sort of uh, uh, setup that you're talking about there. So let's replace that with that uh, light detection. So an example uh, we've put together before is 0 0.041 um, seconds. So that's one millisecond for the light detection and then 40 milliseconds for the ACB to open. That brings down the incident energy to 1.8 calories per centimetre squared. So long, that's pretty damning in terms of the numbers. Um, keep in mind the AS3000 example is a worst case scenario, but you can see there by reducing the amount of energy coming into it, there can be improvements around PPE or exactly how you go about that. Um, but also the amount of energy and cleanup and everything required for the board can significantly change. So coming back to this risk matrix, um, I really wanted to address remote operation, which is something that um, really in 2020 should be kind of a norm. So uh, 
what this does, remote operation, is it means we don't get any um, uh, any reduction in what we can do. Um, so your throughput is all the same, but it reduces the likelihood that an operator's in that area. So that red arrow is moving directly to the left. Um, so you're minimizing how often the operator is in the vicinity of the potential arc fault. So it's an important sort of uh, move that you can do there. So let's have a look at what our options are there. So remote open and close. So tripping coils, closing coils, circuit breakers, motor operators, um, all very, uh, you know, very available these days. Remote racking in high voltage has been around for a very long time for withdrawable switch gear. Um, for low voltage, we've actually got quite a lot of that coming through now. So the NHP system there is in the middle. Um, and the other one which seems to be underutilized a bit is industrial communications. So practically every bit of switch gear out there is now available with a communications variant. Um, so you can pull all that information back to outside of the room to a control room, whatever it is, and you can actually, um, you know, uh, do whatever you need to with that information, make any decisions you need to. Extension of that industrial comms is what we call maintenance mode. Um, so that's where you can actually remotely uh, minimize the trip settings on the switch gear for while the operator is in the room. So going back to selectivity, that's completely compromised during this operation, but the idea is that you're putting safety in front of that selectivity, um, you know, as a priority. So while somebody's in the room, you might get a nuisance trip on the ACB rather than the actual correct gear downstream, uh, but that's something you live with. The last one I wanted to talk about was AFDD, which is relatively new in the miniature circuit breaker world. Um, so these are basically a monitor for analyzing frequency components of the power circuit. So during an arc fault, um, your current magnitude in that sort of main frequency area decreases and your current magnitude outside of that increases. Um, so it's always doing this uh, analysis and it's designed specifically to go to distinguish between arc faults and working arcs such as uh, light switches and plugs. If you play with those, you can get a little spark in there. So it was introduced into AS3000, informative in Australia. So it's only for information, just saying that they exist basically. Um, and in New Zealand, it was brought in for specific applications. So barns, dormitories, buildings with historical significance, museums, where you want to reduce the likelihood of a fire. So a few things that didn't cover in this uh, at all. Uh, so maintenance, there's obviously a fairly large discussion there um, about doing your condition monitoring, doing your thermal scans, doing your servicing to make sure that everything is actually uh, working correctly and that you're not going to get an arc fault from a faulty piece of gear. Training for operators, making sure that they're going through the right procedures and regular testing as well. So a few of the key takeaways uh, so number one, don't work live, or if you do, take appropriate actions. Optimize your protection settings to reduce incident energy. Um, carefully consider the minimum PPE required for the job and consider implementing ELV control voltages, high form ratings, remote operation, arc detection technology. So there's actually quite a bit there that you can start considering. I have listed some further reading here. So this will be available um, in the uh, follow-up emails that go out. So I'll just refer to that they're still there. One in particular is the technical news, which uh, was an article that I wrote in SA form um, covering this sort of similar information. Okay, and we'll move on to some questions. Hi Nick, it's Shane Townsend, HP here. How's it going? Hi Shane, good thanks. Um, thanks for that. Um, we're uh, gone a little bit over time. We did get a lot of questions, but most of them we addressed privately. Um, there was one point of feedback that I'll just make a note of um, regarding the instant energy level calculations, which we'll have to clarify. Um, a few people just raised some questions around the distance and its association to voltage and the IEEE 1584 standard. So 
we can have a look into that and um, rectify anything that wasn't quite right on that slide. Um, but apart from that, uh, yeah, we'll address all the questions either privately or after the fact. So you're right to sign off. Thanks, Nick. OK, thanks, Shane. OK, thank you for your time and apologising for running over time a little bit, uh, but it is good information. Thank you.